ladies and gentlemen, and uh, to Tom and also to Sarah at Bloomfield, thank you first for even considering me and secondly, uh, thank you for all of you to be attending this magnificent evening and I humbly stand here in the name of, of the 454 African soldiers and the 11 Canadians who stayed when everyone else left and ultimately were able to nearly permit to live, although difficult and with difficulty subsequently, uh, about 32,000 Rwandans. But as we did that, we also saw hundreds of thousands who didn't make it. We saw 3.9 million displaced, internally refugeed, all in the space of 100 days. When I wrote my book as the force commander, the subtitle said, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda. And it was on two planes. One was the failure of Rwandans in their sense of humanity. How could they, how could they slaughter the neighbor, family members, with such efficiency, but also with such hate? When I met with the head of the inter militia, for the bulk of the killing were done by youths who had been indoctrinated in a political party youth movement that was slowly turned into a hate organization that ultimately became a militia and in the end did most of the killing and destruction. When I met with the leaders, as was described earlier on by Samantha, and I touched and I shook the hand of this individual who had blood on him, that it wasn't a human hand. There was no there was no temperature to it. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even clammy. I felt I had shaken the hands of the devil. He was there in a human body and he was running rampant in the thousand hills of Rwanda. Literally, humanity had dissipated and neighbors and family were slaughtering each other with reckless abandon. The other side of the subtitle of the failure of humanity in Rwanda was the failure of the rest of humanity, the 191 other countries that refused to one, even listen, but two, refuse to give the UN not only the authority for a mandate that would permit us to use force if we ever had it, but also refuse the UN the assets to be able to reinforce, to be able to stop the slaughter. And that only decades after the Holocaust. And when I confronted that militiaman and said, how can you do this? I'm negotiating to be able to move people between the lines. How can you continue day after day to slaughter and to kill? And he said, who do you think you are, General? He said, how many black Africans were involved in the Holocaust? How dare you tell us that we're savages and that we're inhuman? The only response to that was if we were so deprived in the North to do something as absolutely unimaginable as the Holocaust, why are you trying to imitate it? Why are you continuing? Which they did, and which the media reported. But there was more reporting on the three big networks, and if you remember CNN just starting up, there was more reporting of O.J. Simpson's trial and Tanya Harding kneecapping her opposition scarier than it was of the Rwanda where they were slaughtering tens of thousands a day. 
We got the story out. I lost soldiers getting the story out to the border with Uganda, then getting it to London, to Atlanta, to New York, to Toronto, to Paris. But the stories remained on the cutting floor because they were deemed just too much for us to be able to handle. Is that right? Are such things really too much for us to hand? Are we not nurturing sometimes a hypocritical position of human rights, meaning, meaning that all humans are human and equal? Maybe it's useful, maybe it's a tool that we can refer to, but do we truly believe in it? Do we, are we prepared for the tears and the sweat and sometimes the blood of some of our youth to engage in not only stopping these catastrophes, but even attempting to prevent them? Are all humans human? Or are some humans more human than others? Or do some humans count less than others? In the sixth to seventh week of the genocide, with already over 400,000 slaughtered, we were able to negotiate to start moving people from both ethnic groups between the lines because there was this war going on between the two factions. And as I'm driving through the, the no man's land that had created, been created by the forces who were regrouping, a couple hundred meters ahead, there was a little boy in the middle of the road. And so the immediate reaction was, this will be an ambush, because the extremists were using young children to block the food convoys and the medical supplies and the water convoys, and if the kids didn't stay there, they simply killed them outright. There were over 300,000 children under 15 slaughtered in Rwanda. And so as I approached, expecting an ambush, we slowed down, jumped out. I had a couple of soldiers with me. No ambush. We looked around, there were some huts, and there had been people who once lived there, but now they were just bodies half eaten by dogs and rats. And as we're looking for somebody to take care of this boy where nobody should be, we lost the boy. So we doubled back looking for him and we found him in a hut where there were two adults, male, female, a couple of children, also in advanced decay and eaten. And he was sitting there as if he was at home. So I picked him up and I brought him in front of my vehicle and I looked at him and his stomach was bloated, he was mangy, he was in rags, he was dirty, there were flies all around him. But then I looked into his eyes. And what I saw in the eyes of that little seven-year-old boy was exactly what I saw in the eyes of my seven-year-old son when I left for Africa. They were the eyes of a human child and they were exactly the same. That little boy in that catastrophe was just as human as my son back home. However, by our actions and inactions over the decades since certainly the end of the Cold War, we have established a pecking order in humanity of where we think it's worthy of us to engage, to protect, where the responsibility to protect might be used. And I would argue that now the Sub-Sahara Black African is at the lowest rung of our pecking order of humanity by our decisions to not decide. For indecision or not taking a decision is a decision. Not going, not helping is a decision. And as we see in this era of enormous complexity and ambiguity in these failing states and imploding nations, the difficulties of trying to articulate the mandates, the complexities of what we face in the field with words that have no background, a mandate like establish an atmosphere of security, what does that mean? 
How far do I use force or not? What's an atmosphere of security, a police state? In this era, we see in the field many casualties on our side also. For the ethical, moral, and legal dilemmas that we face on who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Which one do we protect, which one do we not? When the phone was ringing in those first days, and I could hear the people at the end screaming for help and where I'd say, I don't have the troops. I was playing God with them because I knew that they would die and I could hear on too many occasions as they came through the doors and were slaughtering the children and the adults and the phones going dead. But the world did do its sort of standard operating procedure. They did send people in in the first weeks to take a look. And they, and they took a look. And I'd have them debrief me before they leave. And they would say, General, we're, we're going to recommend not to come in, not to assist. And I'd say, why? And they'd say, well, there's nothing here. There's no strategic resource. It's not in our self-interest. The country's not even in a strategic location. And one powerful nation, not yours, one powerful nation, the representative actually said, you know what, the only thing that's here are human beings, and there's too many of them anyways, it's overpopulated. It did not carry the day. The world abandoned other human beings to inhumanity. Yesterday, the 29th of April, is the 20th anniversary of a phone call that I got from the Secretary General of the UN to which Samantha has alluded to. And the phone call was from him telling me that I was to move the remaining few hundred soldiers I had to pull out because the colonial power had told him that we were going to be slaughtered, we were going to be wiped out they had already advanced so well in the genocide and the world had not reacted that they were going to get rid of us and then simply carry on. And so he said, you know, the world can't handle more Blue Berets being killed in Africa as I had already lost 14. The world couldn't handle more Blue Berets being killed but tens of thousands of Rwandans were being slaughtered every day. And so to that call, there was no thought or no sort of analysis to my response. I simply said, no, I'm not leaving, to which I'm sure not many people told him before. And he got mad and repeated the question. I said no again, and he hung up. And then his chief of staff called back and asked me again. And I raise this only to say that although we're getting legal orders, he legally had the responsibility to tell me to pull out with the troops lent to the UN by those countries. His order was immoral. I had already a small force that had pulled out without orders, and in a space of just two hours, 4,000 people were slaughtered. And so, I have served the UN and served my country. My father joined the army 80 years ago. My father and future father-in-law joined the same regiment 79 years ago. They both fought Italy and Northwest Europe, liberated Holland. My dad married a Dutch war bride and my mom seven months ago passed away with a bit of Alzheimer's and the only thing she could remember was the war years. And one thing she remembered that she had never told us before is that three doors down from their little house in Akestrat in Eindhoven, Holland, lived her boyfriend who was a young Jewish student and they had been friends, she was a nurse, student nurse, 
and they'd been going out for quite some time. And she described in that state, and she was dying, she described the hurt of the night when they went to that house and emptied it and took that family away. You have suffered. You bear the scars of it. You commemorate the memory you don't want people to forget. You have taken this cause as one of the most fundamental causes of not only your community, but for the world, the never again cause. But it failed the Rwandans and failed us 20 years ago. But the fact that you are recognizing and supporting and that the museum is doing a lot of work with Rwanda to try and educate, to try and advocate that we do not let human beings lose their sense of humanity in a lust for power and use any of our differences the frictions of some of our differences as the cause celeb to do it. Are all humans human? Or are some more human than others? If you can't respond spontaneously that we are all equal and deserve the same respect, then we've got still a long road ahead and we will lose many and many innocents will die as many soldiers will be deployed and diplomats and come back injured, psychologically destroyed by witnessing not only the destruction of which they cannot stop, but facing new weapons of our era like rape as an instrument of war like the use of children as the primary weapon of war, 9, 10, 12, 14, 40% of which of the nearly 250,000 children at any one time, now still today, are girls, are being used as the primary weapons in these conflicts. And that doesn't seem to be strong enough for us to intervene. Ladies and gentlemen, the work we're doing on trying to eradicate the use of children as weapons of wars has come to a conclusion that when people recruit children in conflicts, it is one of the first signs that you are going to see mass atrocities and potentially genocide for you recruit children to go to the extremes of which they cannot themselves control due to drugs and fear and indoctrination. Eradicate the use of children as weapons of war. And eradicate from us this concept that maybe some of us are more human than others. Thank you very much.